All right, Ninja Nerds, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about blood vessel characteristics. So what I want to do is I want to go over a bunch of different vessels, talk about their, their structure, their function, a little bit about their histology, what's some you know, special characteristics about them. So first thing I want to do is I want to talk about the different types of vessels. So let's, kinda, let's go over them. We're going to kind of label them, and then we're going to try to hit each one individually. So the first one I want to talk about within the artery department is we're going to talk about our elastic conducting arteries, right? So this is the one that we're going to talk about here, the elastic conducting arteries. The second one I want to talk about is going to be called the muscular distributing arteries. Then I want to talk about the arterioles. And then we're going to discuss the different types of capillaries very briefly. We'll go into them in more detail in uh, microcirculation. And then we're going to talk briefly about venules, not too much again. And we're going to spend more time on our veins. All right, so the ones that we're going to spend a lot of time on in this video is uh, elastic, the muscular distributing. We'll talk a little bit about arterioles and we're gonna talk about a lot about veins. All right, so first things first, let's talk about elastic conducting arteries. So if we take elastic conducting arteries, these arteries are usually an example of larger, larger vessels, right? So for example, let's say I take, here's my left atrium, then I got left ventricle, then I got the aorta, right? For example, the aorta is one of the prime examples of an elastic conducting artery, right? And then obviously think about the branches of that. You got the uh, brachiocephalic, which gives way to the right. So then after that, you'll get the right common carotid and the right subclavian, right? So even these guys are gonna be high pressure systems. They're able to take on a lot, and a, I mean a lot of pressure. But if you think about the aorta, the thoracic, the abdominal, the brachiocephalic artery, those are going to be higher pressure systems that have to be able to stretch and take on that high amounts of systolic pressure, right? So they have to be able to stretch and then recoil. So elastic conducting arteries are, again, good examples of like the aorta ascending, aortic arch, thoracic, abdominal, and the brachiocephalic, right? Those are just a couple examples. And then if you think about them, they have a pretty big diameter. Their diameter ranges at about uh, 1 to uh, 1 1.5 centimeters in diameter, right? So that's the elastic conducting arteries. The muscular distributing arteries, if you think about it, let's see here I have the aorta. Let's say we go down, we have the diaphragm here. Let's say here's the diaphragm. So then we go down into the abdominal aorta. You know off the abdominal aorta you have a bunch of different arteries. One can come up, give way to the uh, suprarenal artery. One could be the renal artery. And we could just keep going. One could be the gonadal, and you see superior mesenteric, so on and so forth, right? So this one could go and supply the adrenal gland. <clears throat> this one can go and supply the kidney. But they're basically arteries that are delivering blood to a specific organ, right? So these ones right here that are taking blood and delivering it to the tissues, these ones are going to be called your muscular distributing arteries, right? So for example, the renal artery, the suprarenal artery. If you think about another one, there's the inferior phrenic artery. And we could just keep going on and on and on, right? It supplies the diaphragm. But the muscular distributing arteries, again, they're going to be high pressure systems. They're going to have an extremely thick tunica media, very, very thick tunica media. And again, these guys' diameter, because of the thick tunica media, it changes, and it goes to about six millimeters. Okay? Arterials. Arterials, so if I were to zoom in on this part right here, let's say I zoom in on the kidney and I blow that up, right? So if I look, let's say here, I have an arterial, right? The arterioles are going to be the ones that are feeding a capillary bed. So let's imagine this is a capillary bed here. And then let's say off of this, obviously, you have your true capillaries, right? So let's say here's our true capillaries coming off of our, our vascular shunt here. So again, these arterioles are the ones that are feeding it, right? They're the ones that are feeding this capillary bed right here. Well, arterioles are very, very small vessels. Again, very, very small vessels. They pry range in diameter about... 35 microns, so about 35 micrometers in diameter. So they're, they're pretty, pretty small uh, diameter, right? They're not very big. And so with these guys, what's really, really important about arterioles, one of the most important things about arterioles is that if you remember it, they have a nice little smooth muscle layer here wrapping around this actual uh, 
metarterial, and it could be the very, very important. And they can actually be right around the bed. Actually, they're more specifically right around the bed of the, ca the capillaries, the true capillaries. These guys are called pre-capillary sphincters. And they're smooth muscle, and basically whenever the sympathetic nervous system innervates them, it causes them to constrict, right? So one of the biggest things about arterioles is that they are high resistance vessels. They develop the most resistance to blood flow. Okay, so that's one of the big things to remember about arterioles is that they're extremely high resistant vessels. Okay? And then if you get into the last one here, for the arterial side, it's going to be the capillaries. Now the capillaries are obviously extremely small. They range in diameter probably right around eight uh, to about 10 micrometers in diameter, right? So if you look at a capillary here, and let's say I zoom out on that capillary now. So let's say I take a piece of this capillary and I zoom out on that now. So if I look at this capillary, now you have three types of capillaries, and I'm not gonna mention too much about them right now. Like I said, we'll talk about them more in uh, microcirculation, but the inner lining of the capillary has that tunica intima or tunica internal lining, right? With the simple squamous uh, epithelial cells, right? And then it has a tiny little uh, basement membrane here, just a tiny little basement membrane, right? And then on top of that, it obviously can have large intercellular, it can have some intercellular clefts or some fenestration pores, and it might even have tight junctions depending upon what type of capillary it is. And another thing that has, depending upon where it is, is it can even have these little like types of smooth muscle cells called pericytes. All right, and like I said, we'll go into more detail on this. And then one thing wrapping all the way around that is a basal lamina. Okay, it's a basal lamina which is like a connective tissue layer, a thin little connective tissue layer, right? That's called a basal lamina. But basically what capillaries are designed to do is they're designed for exchange, gas exchange, nutrient exchange, hormone exchange, waste exchange, but they're basically exchange vessels. So what's the significance of capillaries? They're designed to be exchange vessels. And like I said, we're gonna talk about exactly the mechanisms of exchange when we get into bulk flow and microcirculation, all right? But for right now, that's what I just wanted to focus on. So again, elastic conducting arteries, about one to 1.5 centimeters, extremely high pressure systems. They have to be able to be extremely elastic and recoil. Muscular distributing about six millimeters in diameter. And these are gonna be the ones that are delivering blood specifically to that organ. For example, the renal artery or the suprarenal artery or the inferior phrenic artery. Okay, and they're gonna have an extremely thick tunica media. Then we can get into the arterioles, which are about uh, 35 micrometers in diameter. And again, they have these pre-capillary sphincters, these smooth muscle layers, right, that can control the resistance, and they are the resistance vessels. They're where the highest amount of resistance are. And then again, these true capillaries, they're exchange vessels, and again, they consist of a tunica interna, uh, a tiny little layer of uh, a subendothelial layer, and then after that, it has these tiny little parasites depending upon the capillaries, and then a basal uh, lamina are outside of that, right? Venules. I'm not gonna to spend too much time about venules because again, we're gonna go over that whenever you get into microcirculation. But if you look here, for right now, this is an arterial, it's called your terminal arterial. This is your meta arterial. This is your, your capillary bed right here. And then this part right here, at the end of the capillary bed is called the post capillary venule. And then that drains into this, eventually this terminal, it goes into this venule here, this post capillary venule. So it goes post capillary venule, and then eventually it'll form uh, large veins. So. I'm not gonna to talk too much about venules just for right now. I know that they're uh, basically gonna be the part that the, the initial part that after the capillary bed and their diameter is about 20 micrometers in diameter, right? All right, veins. Veins is the ones that I really wanna spend some time on in this video. What's important about veins is that they, they have a pretty big diameter also. They're about five millimeters in diameter um, on average. And what's important about veins? So here's what I wanna spend some time on with veins, because veins are extremely interesting, right? We know that arteries are high pressure systems, right? They're designed to be able to distribute blood to various parts of the body for your systemic circuits, right? And so, and depending upon your coronary circuit, your pulmonary circuit, but they're extremely high pressure systems. Venous uh, blood is not high pressure systems. They're designed to be lower pressure systems. This, these pressures usually only get to about five to 10 uh, millimeters of mercury, so on average. 
So that's pretty low pressure system. It's an extremely low pressure system. What's so important about veins that I want to mention is if you look at veins, some of the characteristics of veins, right? Veins, uh, they have a very thin tunica media. And I'm going to get into these, uh, these tunics here in a second. Very thin tunica media. All right, and so they have a huge lumen. They have a larger lumen, okay? Larger lumen, and they're described to be capacitance vessels or reservoirs of blood. So they're kind of designed to be what's called capacitance vessels. In other words, veins account for about 70% of our total blood volume at, at any one instant. So at any one instant, they account for about 70% of your total blood volume. So they hold a decent amount of blood. Here's the problem though. If you think about it, let's say I draw here, I draw the right side of the heart. So let's say here's our uh, superior vena cava, right atrium, and then let's say here's your inferior vena cava, and then there's your right ventricle and the pulmonary, sorry, or the pulmonary arteries, right? So if you think about this, what's important to know is, is that veins are, again, are not very high pressure systems. So how do we get the blood to get back up against gravity? without having, not having that much muscle. If you don't have that much muscle with inside the vessel, you're gonna have to cut, develop a couple different types of uh, adaptations, right? So that's what the veins do. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in on a vein, I'm gonna show a couple specialties of a vein. So again, you have your tunica interna, right? Such so as these endothelial cell lining. So what's important is these tunica interna, they kind of fold inwards and form these little valves, all right? So let's say here's again another folding of the tunica interna, another folding of the tunica interna. I'm gonna develop these valves here. And they're basically just, again, internal folds of the tunica interna. Now look at what can happen here. If the blood is pushed up this way, and I'll explain how you can push it, right? If the blood is pushed up this way, it's gotten into this part here, and then basically what can happen is some of it can circulate back down, right? And when it goes and circulates back down, what is it going to do? It's going to push the valves closed to prevent the blood from backflowing into the inferior portion of that vein. And that's important, right? Because that's what keeps them basically the blood pooling up and leading to a condition we'll call uh, later varicose veins. So that's one important thing for veins to be able to get the blood back up to the heart. So again, one thing is valves. Second thing that's extremely important. If you remember your veins, again, are not very high pressure systems, right? So if you know, usually what your veins are near is they're usually near some muscles. So let's say we take, for example, the, vein, uh, the veins inside of your legs, right? So let's say here's some skeletal muscles like your, maybe the gastrocnemius or the soleus muscles, right? And let's say that they're on both sides, actually. So let's say here we have another one, right? And here's another one. And let's say that these muscles contract. And when they contract, they start squeezing on the blood vessel. They start squeezing onto the actual blood vessel. And whenever they squeeze onto the blood vessel, whenever they shorten, they push the blood upwards, right? So whenever they push the blood upwards, it's called like a muscular milking because it's not very fast. It's a slow process, but it just keeps contracting and pushing the blood upwards. So this right here is called, and the second thing here, which we described is called a muscular milking, all right? And it's basically, again, the, the muscles, are, the, the actual somatic muscles, right? The skeletal muscles are gonna be contracting and pushing the blood upwards. That's one. Another one is called a respiratory pump. And a respiratory pump is basically whenever you, you're breathing, you're increasing the thoracic cavity volume, right? And what it does, do, it does is it actually, as you increase that thoracic cavity volume, it actually can push on some of those actual lower vessels, like the inferior vena cava, and it can help to push that blood upwards. Also, it can help with the blood coming back from the pulmonary circuit, too. So it helps to be able to increase the blood flow back to the actual heart, and it helps to get the blood flow up from the actual lower systemic circuits, right, the systemic veins. So that's one. So again, Respiratory pump helps to get more blood from the lungs back to the heart, and it helps to get some of the systemic blood back up to the heart, right? That's called the respiratory pump. One more thing that's also important. 
there is tunica media in the blood vessel. It's just not that thick, right? So let's see here, I get rid of this part right here. And I say I draw here a tunica media, just a couple smooth muscle cells, okay? This is important because the tunica media, if you remember, let's say I draw here central nervous system, right? And then out of the central nervous system, you know that you have your sympathetic nerves, right? And let's say that these sympathetic nerves, they come over here and they innervate, right? They innervate this tunica media. And what can that do? That can cause venoconstriction. So it can also cause a venoconstriction of that smooth muscle. And that can also help to be able to push some of the blood also up there, right? So the fourth thing that we could also say down here is going to be sympathetic tone. Sympathetic tone. Now you're probably wondering why I'm mentioning all this, like what's so important about it. All right, so with these valves, these are extremely important. The reason why is, is that some people, uh, maybe it's due to obesity, maybe it's due to standing for long periods of time, uh, is, you know, depending upon what it might be, these valves can become in, uh, incompetent and leaky. And so what happens is, let's say due to whatever reasons these, these, uh, these blood vessels start expanding, right? Because of people standing for a long time and the blood just pooling up in that area. What well, starts expanding and expanding and expanding, and then what happens is it pulls, so imagine here, as I try to pull this blood vessel away from one another, I'm pulling these two edges away. So then what starts happening to the space between the, va the valves? It starts increasing, and then blood starts moving back down. As the blood starts moving back down, it starts pooling up in one area. So imagine all this blood just pooling up in this area here. And as the blood starts pooling up in this area, it starts becoming torturous or twisting, right? So it starts pooling up and dilating, and then it starts becoming torturous or twisted. That is called varicose veins. They're very common within the calf, right? So that's one of the common areas. Another one that they're common in is in the testes. Uh, there, it's actually called varicocele. And what happens is, is sometimes it's actually more common in the left testy because the gonadal vein, uh, the left gonadal vein, if you look here real quick, let's say I draw the, uh, here let's say you have your inferior vena cava here. And then what happens is you have your left gonadal vein it comes up over here with the uh, renal artery, right? So what happens is it comes up here and it makes this, this crazy turn to put the blood into the inferior vena cava, whereas the right gonadal goes straight to the inferior vena cava. So what happens is the blood can actually kind of uh, lead to this backflow into the testes, and whenever it backflows into the testes, again, it can lead to this torturous or dilating or accumulation of these blood vessels within the testes, and that can lead to what's called varicocele. And that can lead to infertility, it can lead to dilation, it can lead to uh, a pretty big scrotum. So again, if this is the left testes and it starts actually causing this dilation and this torturous formation of these vessels, it's called varicocele. And again, this could be a problem because it could lead to inflammation, it could lead to expansion, uh, swelling of the left testicle, and on top of that, it could actually lead to infertility, okay? All right, so we talked about varicocele, okay? And again, what was this problem here called whenever the uh, blood starts pooling up within this area and starts becoming twisting, and it, so it becomes torturous, and the blood vessels start dilating, and it forms these ugly little veins on the back of the leg, right? That's, again, it's called varicose veins, okay? All right, and then another area that's gonna occur, it doesn't just have to happen in the, within the blood vessels, and it doesn't just have to happen here within the testes, it can also occur in another part, which is the anus, right? So one of the common areas is the veins inside the anus. They're actually called the hemorrhoidal veins, sometimes due to high pressure, straining, forcing to go to the bathroom, doing the Valsava's maneuver, and so on and so forth. The pressure can accumulate, and again, that can happen too. And so another form of varicose veins is hemorrhoids. All right, and so that's another example of varicose veins.